Oh, this is Tesla. now. Good afternoon. Welcome to this workshop on the Cameroon Anglophone Crisis. My name is Susan Crabiel, and I am the Associate for Refugees and Asylum with the Presbyterian Church USA. You are invited to share in the chat where you're from and your faith community connection. We will try to leave some time at the end for a few questions if you'd like to also enter them into the chat. According to UNHCR, there are an estimated 1.5 million internally displaced persons in Cameroon and almost a half million refugees living there. Our focus today is on the Anglophone conflict, now in its seventh year. Today's presentation, however, does not end in Cameroon. Our last speaker will be sharing about the human rights abuses that have taken place here in the U.S. against Cameroonian asylum seekers in many cases leading to their wrongful deportation where they confront retaliation and further human rights violations. Before I introduce our speakers, I wanna take a moment to acknowledge the human suffering caused by the ongoing conflicts and human rights abuses. I am grateful to each one of our speakers for sharing with us their own experiences, perspectives, and insights. We know that there are strong emotions and differing views about how to end this conflict and hold our leaders accountable. So we ask you to honor our speakers today with your attention and that you convey respect in any comments or questions you wish to share. So now let me introduce our speakers, all three of whom are Cameroonian nationals. Our first is Jeff Napoleon Bamenjo joining us from Yaoundé. Jeff serves as the coordinator of RELUFA, the network for the fight against hunger, which is a partner of the Presbyterian USA in Cameroon. Jeff coordinates advocacy campaigns on land and food justice and transparency in the extractive industries. He holds a master's degree in development studies from The Hague, where he majored in politics of alternative development and a bachelor's degree in political science. Our second speaker is Dr. Catherine Nkongo Dufum, founder and CEO of AXED Consulting. She worked over 15 years as a senior legal advisor and policy analyst at the Prime Minister's office in Cameroon. In that role, she was part of many litigation teams responsible for state legal disputes, notably before the International Arbitration Court in Paris, France. She also helped shape the legal and administrative frameworks in youth employment, social and environmental policies, and results-based management within the Cameroonian public service. Dr. Nfum has worked with many nonprofit organizations that promote girls' education, social entrepreneurship, and community leadership. And she holds a doctoral degree in public administration from the University of Ottawa. Daniel Say is the coordinator of the Cameroon Advocacy Network, a coalition of organizations and activists advocating for the freedom and dignity of Cameroonians. They stand in solidarity with all black immigrants fighting for liberation. Daniel is also the Black Immigrants Bail Fund Coordinator for Haitian Bridge Alliance, based in San Diego, California. He holds two Master's in Laws degrees, the most recent from Chapman University School of Law. Daniel came to the U.S. as an asylum seeker at the U.S.-Mexico border, and it is no small part due to Daniel's leadership and community organizing that the U.S. government designated Cameroon for temporary protected status just 10 days ago. So thank you to our speakers. And with that, I'm going to turn it over um, to Jeff to get us started. Just a second, I wanna get that. Go ahead, Jeff, and start while I get your PowerPoint up. should be. Okay. 
Go ahead, Jeff. I can't. We, we can we can we can see each other. Hey, Susan, can you take somebody else while we fix the sound? Yeah, we're having trouble hearing you, Jeff. Yeah, I can't, we can't hear you. Um, Kathy, maybe we'll go ahead and, and, and let you start and then we'll come back to Jeff. All right. Sorry. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you loud okay. All right. Hello, everyone, once more. And thank you to the organizers of this conference and for the invitation to this uh, Ecumenical Advocacy Days 2022. So we are discussing the Anglophone crisis in Cameroon, which is going on uh, since October 2016, over five years from now. So the crisis has, called, has already caused thousands of, uh, of deaths. And as you said, Susan, he has already uh, caused uh, more than 500,000 internally displaced persons and refugees abroad. Uh, but despite this, those figures, I think it's unfortunate that uh, we can observe that this crisis did not arouse uh, much awareness either inside uh, the country or internationally. Uh, some commentators call this crisis the forgotten conflict. This is why I welcome this uh, initiative and I thank you for putting up this, uh, this conference. Let me now present a few facts on Cameroon. You know, Cameroon is a country for about 28 million inhabitants and 50% or 60% of its population is under 25 years old. 80% uh, of the population in Cameroon is English and uh, French speaking. Meanwhile, 20% uh, is English speaking. Cameroon is known for being a mosaic of tribes because it has more than 250 ethnic groups, which is why it's called a Africa in miniature. And also we can say that Cameroon is, has been, uh, the, the poverty in Cameroon has increased from 20, 20, 2007 to 2014. Uh, the, the World Bank said that the poverty has increased and is now touching uh, one third of the population. The, pop the poor population is found mostly in the northern part of Cameroon. Of course, many other areas of Cameroon face the same poverty-related challenges. Um, speaking about the administrative organization, uh, Cameroon is uh, a decentralized unitary state with 10 regions, two of which uh, are English-speaking and eight others are French-speaking. So in that regard, I'm saying that Cameroon is still in search of its true identity because the country looks like it's torn between traditional values, colonial inherited, and the constraints of modern societies. Since the subject that brings us together today has its roots in the form of the state, I can say from the outset of my presentation that it is also in the redefinition of the new form of the state that the Anglophone crisis will, in my humble opinion, find is a lasting solution. Therefore, today I'm talking about taking peace for granted for institutional arrogance to an uncertain future. I'm saying this because I will raise three fundamental reasons and I'll try to wrap my, my remarks around them quickly, starting with the origin of the crisis. Uh, the origin of the crisis, some people will say that is the, the protest, but I think the, the crisis started since October 1st, 1961. He was dormant because since that date, the date of the reunification of both Cameroons, there was, there's been many constitutional tinkering from both successive head of states, from Mr. Aijo to Mr. Bia, between federalism to what is called in Cameroon reunification, and then from reunification 
to federalism in 1972, and from, from federalism to unitary state in 1984, and from there to what is called now decentralized unitary state since 1996. And again, in 2019, after uh, the, the Grand National Dialogue organized by the government, the two regions of Cameroon involved in this crisis, that is the Northwest and the Southwest region, they were granted what is called a special status under the provision of the Cameroonian constitution. So this, this special status implies that these two regions, they can now develop uh, their own uh, public policies in the areas of education and justice, which are two, the two policy sectors from which the crisis originated in October 2016, when English speaking lawyers and teachers started marching to complain about their working condition. So clearly, the crisis could have, could have been avoided if the solution was, if the problem were addre was addressed at the time. But the institutional and constitutional co procrastination are really the root cause of the crisis. But I want to, to stress now. This is my second point on the aggravating factor. For me, the aggravating factor of the crisis is what I call the institutional arrogance of the political power of, Cam of Yaoundé. Because in, in Cameroon, we have uh, a president of a republic who once said that, and I quote, when Yaoundé breeds, Cameroon is alive. Meaning that when the capital city is safe and stable, it doesn't matter what is happening in other parts of the country. And what the, when the crisis, uh, at the inception of the crisis in, uh, in October 2016, the government was just in denial. They minimized the scope of the social discontent of the two corporations I mentioned, the lawyers and the teachers. And then when the population joined, the, the government sent an ambulance police response to, to, to dismantle the, the, protest, the protest and the manifestation, which led to the, and the general indifference that we observe in the country now. The, country, the, the, the crisis is still going on, but it looks like not, not much, nobody, nobody cares anymore. I would like to address also the cost of the crisis, which is very high. We know the crisis has caused thousands of deaths, so the loss of many lives. Which, which, which could have been, they could have been spared. We also know that the, there was many uh, multiple destruction. We remember what happened in Gabu, what happened with the Catholic College Queen of Rosary in Manfe, who was born, that was born to, to Archis. And I can also mention about a million of children and teenagers who were deprived of school or their schooling was disrupted because of the instability in those two regions. My own son was one of those children because he was going to school in that part of Cameroon. Thank God he made it out alive. But many of his classmates did not have the, they were not, they were not uh, 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 lucky as, as he, he was. My question was, do, do, do those children need or do they deserve this? What have they done to deserve this, this fate? Many of them have lost their lives and they are still bearing this uh, trauma up to now. We can also talk about the devastating effects of this crisis of what we call in Cameroon, living together. In French, it say, uh, vivre ensemble, which is a slogan from the government of Cameroon. But you cannot have this kind of slogan on one hand and you continue to marginalize a, a, a bunch, I mean, a community because the fact that those, that community is in Cameroon is the, is the rich, is the wealth of Cameroon because it's the one, it's their presence that creates diversity in Cameroon. Cameroon will not be a bilingual country if there was no English speaking or Anglophone community. So when we talk about living together, vivre ensemble, and we marginalize a part of that community, it, does, it just doesn't make any sense. This is why I'm talking about institutional arrogance because on the one hand, you have slogans, political uh, 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 motto, and on the other hand, you don't have any commitment to this uh, 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 motto, to these uh, slogans. I can also state the, the financial cost of the crisis, just to mention two examples. First, when the, the internet was shut down for more than 90 days in Buea and Bamenda, 
Boya is, is known to, for being the Silicon Mountain of Cameroon. You have dozens of startups over there created by young people. I cannot even imagine how those young people who put their savings, their personal savings to create their companies and then they have to face the loss because of the crisis, because there were shutdowns, because there were boycotts and, and uh, ghost, ghost towns. In 2018, the Cameroonian uh, Business Association published a report saying that by then, in 2018, the crisis has cost more than 272 billion of CFA francs. That is, I think, around 400, 40 or 50 billion USA, US, US dollars. This is too much for a poor country like Cameroon. Everybody can imagine what could have been done with such an amount of money to help improve the well-being and the quality of life of people on a daily basis. Let's now talk about possible solutions. The first thing I would like to mention is that I think the government decided to go with administrative measures to solve a political issue, which is completely inappropriate for what I can say. For example, the government created a Ministry of Decentralization in 2018. The government created a National Committee of Disarmament, Demobilization, and Reintegration for ex combat of Boko Haram and the armed group in the Northwest and the, and the Southwest regions. And also the government granted, as I said, a special status to the Northwest and the, and the Southwest regions in 2019. All these administrative measures, they are totally inappropriate to solve the crisis because the crisis is fundamentally a political one. Because this crisis exposes the flaws of a system of governance rooted in corruption and in the massive and compulsive enrichment of an, of an elite few to the detriment of the majority of the population. This crisis also highlights the non-respect of the rule of law by the government of Cameroon, especially when you consider the fact that the constitutional uh, provision takes too much time to be implemented. Some articles of the constitution took 20 years to be implemented. So even the special status that was granted to the Northwest and the Southwest region in 2019, we don't really know exactly if it's gonna be implemented in the near future, maybe we will not be on this world. So the Cameroonian government now is at the crossroad because for me, it can no longer postpone the debate on the form of the state and the model of governance that, that the people of Cameroon deserve. Because it's important for the government to create the condition for a sincere and lasting political consensus, which will conducive to a greater state efficiency. Also, with this crisis, what, what we can say is that we see that local uh, community, community issues are inviting themselves into the Cameroonian constitutional debate. So that too, analysts, political analysts should be aware of that, and the government should also be advised to recognize those regional particularisms by protecting the, the minorities. In doing so, the government will make sure that they do not create unfortunate precedent which will offer other communities inspiration or ground for their le legitimate claim. Because we have many tensions in Cameroon ar around the north, we see the northern people organizing themselves. They want to create their own, their own uh, community to claim uh, their own rights. You know, if you grant this to the north and the west part of Cameroon, you, the government will have to grant the same to other part of Cameroon. Moreover, talking about the humanitarian assistance plan that the government put in place, that one too is completely ineffective. I can say except for few civil servants who can get money from that plan and being, uh, be, uh, become rich, the plan is not working at all. Because there, were, there has never been a ceasefire and there has never been an official surrender of the separatist armed group up to now. So it's important that religious organization like uh, EAD, I, I think, or uh, civil society organizations, or even the, the Cameroonian diaspora, it's important that we, we raise awareness on this conflict. Even though the diaspora now is divided on the conflict, that too, it should be mentioned, but we should be uh, uh, aware that it's not by ignoring the conflict that this conflict is going to be, be come to an end. It is by uniting ourselves, by our, uniting our forces, our ideas, creating advocacy network that the same way you are doing here, 
is that way that we can help uh, dra drag some international uh, uh, relief to the people of those of those regions. So finally, I want to state that from my own humble point of view, the secessionist agenda of Cameroon is, is dead end because it's just strategically misleading and it doesn't represent the reach of most Cameroonians on both sides of the Mungo River. That means the French speaking and the English speaking Cam uh, Cameroonians. I think Cameroonians now what they want is they are looking forward for a renewal of the political elite because the president has been there for, for, 30, for 40 years. People like me, my generation, we don't know what to explain to our children anymore about the reason why the same president has been there for so long. So there, the crisis is there and the contest is also there. You have young African, African, uh, African youth who, who is uh, uh, awakening politi politically and they are becoming more aware of their capacity to resist all kind of imperialism. So they are claiming for more authentic uh, models let's, of conflict let's keep watching the time, and for the development of African countries. So I'm sorry if I went above the time. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. And thank you to all of you. Thank you. Jeff, we're gonna give you another try. Let's see if, if your microphone is working now. Yeah, thank you, Susan. I think this time around is better. It yes. seemed I was muted from, from your side. Uh, again, I think I'll just continue without necessarily following the PowerPoint. Uh, what I'll just do is to make some remarks. I followed attentively with the presentation that uh, Katy gave. And my initial intention was just to set the stage. And I'm sure Katy has uh, covered most of the points. And what we'll do is just to keep it short so that we have enough time for questions and answers. I'm happy to be part of this panel discussion about the Anglophone crisis in, in, in Cameroon. And maybe to properly summarize what Cathy just planted as the, the background for this. I too am an Anglophone and I come from that part and anything about the Anglophone crisis is not actually new to me. The way I can summarize the Anglophone problem is the incapacity of the government to make the cohabitation of two different colonial cultures possible in one country. This is the crux of the matter. And I like the word that she used in terms of the arrogance. It is because of the arrogance of the government that has led us to where we are. And what I always tell people is that the Anglophone crisis is not about the Anglophones being against the Fran Francophones. I think it is a political problem and we should be solved politically. But it is very, very unfortunate the way it is being handled. That said, what I can just focus on now is, as Cathy said, this is actually the legacy of two different colonial cultures. And the institution of the United States in 1972 actually precipitated the feeling of marginalization from Anglophones. And complaints by Anglophones of marginalization under successive governments, led by President Ahijo and also Bia. And that is actually the origin. And then the trigger, as she said, no assimilated Anglophone, Anglophone culture, which was badly handled by the government. And this does not mean that before then, there had not been complaints. The complaints have always been there. The problem is known, but it is not handled. However, I think what is actually important for us now is just to quickly highlight the human rights atrocities that are being uh, caused. And I don't, I know I call it a conflict or a crisis, it is actually a war because there are two belligerent groups actually fighting and killing. So many people, thousands of people are in the prisons. And I cannot clearly state the numbers because having the clear figures is a problem and I don't want to venture into that because I know I will not state the exact figures. I visit the prisons, I see them and I see thousands of them and what is peculiar is that most of the guys who are in prison they are not necessarily the ones who took up the weapons. They are the guys who were arrested just because they were striking and just because they are anglophones. What is happening with the guys who took up the weapons 
is maybe they are killed, or if they surrender, they are put in the DDR centers. So this is really uh, paradoxical to me. And also, there is arbitrary arrest, and that is why so many people are in, are in prison without any judgment. There is kidnap, there is rape, there is torture, both by the military and also the separatists who are fighting. They kidnap people for ransom. And there is no single Anglophone who is not either directly or indirectly affected by this, by this conflict. I have cousins or brothers who are there who have been kidnapped or who have been killed or whose houses have been, have been raised. So this is actually what is happening. Mass graves is already like something very common. And this happens basically every day. And also one very unfortunate thing is that this is a crisis that is, you hardly hear about it in the media. I think this is one of the most forgotten uh, crises. And therefore, what do we do? Do we just sit and remain indifferent? Despite the negligence or the neglect, we have to continue to speak. And such an arena is very, very important for us to express our views. And it is very difficult, as Cathy said, not everybody sees it from the same angle. But I think what is very, very important now is we need to go to the root causes if we really want to solve the problem. And to do that, we have to stop the fighting. And I think this is very, very important. And imagine the trauma that people are going through. Imagine your father, your mother, your wife, your husband, a child or a brother or a sister who is killed or even raped in front of you. Imagine a pregnant woman giving birth in the bush with no assistance or no medical support. Imagine a house being burned with elderly people inside who cannot help themselves. These are things that are happening and these are the things that are really traumatizing people and then there is really need for trauma, trauma healing. Therefore, quickly, what can people do under current circumstances? First of all, the essence is, since this crisis is really neglected, is for people, especially those who are participating in this, uh, in this forum, to know about the conflict and to engage in finding lasting solutions. How can they engage, especially the constituency in the United States of America? Contact your representatives, either in Congress or in Senate, to continue to remind them about what is happening in Cameroon. Because this is now since 2016. Children are not going to school, but they seem nobody cares. And also, why not also support the humanitarian efforts towards Cameroon? And above all, since most of us are Christians, keep the suffering people of Cameroon in prayer. I think I can end there with respect to my remarks so that at least we have uh, enough time for comments, questions, and answers. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jeff. And as we move to Daniel, I remind people, if you do have questions, you're welcome to put them in the chat as we go along. And then after Daniel speaks, we'll have some time for Q&A. Thank you so much, Susan. Um, thank you, Kathy and uh, uh, my brother, Jeff. Um, I mean, before has been said, and uh, I think people are beginning to understand um, why this has been a cry for Cameroonians for a very, very long time. As Cathy said, the issue is not that there's no crisis, it's just that it's, it's neglected. The issue is just neglected and relegated to the background. Um, same thing that the country itself has relegated the issues that Cameroonians have been facing for a long time. And I think as you know, Jab again highlighted, it's important that people participating in this event and other people should take it upon themselves personally to consider humanity for Cameroonians and for, of course other people around the world to talk about this issue, highlight and educate people for people to be aware of what's happening in Cameroon. Um, you know, I don't need to go back into all the details because everything has been said um, and there's a clear understanding of what's happening in Cameroon. And of course, when there is violence and conflicts or there's war, like what is happening in Ukraine or Afghanistan a couple of weeks ago, people are forced to flee. So we've had several thousands of Cameroonians who have fled from Cameroon. Millions of them have been internally displaced. And, you know, hundreds of thousands of them have fled to neighboring countries like Nigeria, Ghana, 
and personally a lot of people who are fleeing to these areas so again it's so shocking how the world receives this this happenings some people that are, are, are fleeing from other countries are tend to be treated as you know quote unquote like some people said white blonde educated refugees and people fleeing from Cameroon are considered as you know nothing and that humanity is not validated so thousands of Cameroonians fled to the United States and other countries to seek for refuge and uh, you know from persecution and this violence uh, that you know my, my, my brother and my sister have all explained here and uh, we've seen how even after arriving in the United States as for an example Cameroonians were deported back to Cameroon so it, it's it's triggering to see how you know after all of these terrible conditions that are happening we still have you know a, a system where you know they, they, they put a blind, blind eye to the situations that are happening and then they still send people back to these dangerous conditions uh, which is not right the same year of you know the previous administration of the United States, about two deportation flights left to Cameroon. That's what we can keep track of, and over 180 uh, Cameroonians were deported, um, uh, and you know most most of them were asylum seekers who were fleeing from these terrible conditions in Cameroon. And so, after a period of time, we created the Cameroon Advocacy Network, as Susan mentioned, which is uh, which was launched back in 2021 under the partnership of the Haitian Bridge Alliance and the Robert F Kennedy Human Rights um, Organization, which is simply um, a coalition of dynamic Cameroonians and activists and other organizations to fight, you know, for the protection of Cameroonians and other Black immigrants who are fleeing violence. So I can say that um, um, as we as we've noticed how you know Cameroonians have been treated while deported, being tortured in ICE detention facilities here in the United States, we've been crying out that individuals should be protected. And recently, we were able to acquire what we called temporary protected status for Cameroon, which came after a very, very long fight um, for several years. Rem remember, this same protection was offered for Ukraine and Afghanistan after little or no effort. So this is just to highlight that, you know, the world today, the system today continues to validate humanity for some certain people and then leave it out for some certain people. Um, um, so it is important that we organize that immigration is a black issue, Black people are suffering and facing violence as it is happening in Cameroon. So the world, media, individuals should take it upon themselves to talk about this issue and extend the same help and attention that is happening in uh, 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 the same help and attention that, that they are providing to other countries as well to Cameroon or, you know, just humanity should be universal. And so that's what I'm trying to say here. So after fleeing, you know, this dangerous and outrageous uh, conditions and fleeing your home, you are being turned away, and not only being turned away, but even after uh, being put in detention for after, over more than a year, you're being deported and put in chains and being tortured and forced to sign your deportation. And, you know, the conditions are so outrageous. Last year, we did put out a complaint and a lawsuit, which is called the RAP complaint, which is simply a complaint against the um, United States Immigration and Customs Enforcement. Um, for the terrible treatment that happened to some certain Cameroonians who were on the two last deportation flights that went to Cameroon, who were being uh, succumbed and put in what we call a wrap stress position, uh, which was a very terrible position, being bound on your hand and your leg and put in an L shape, which is a terrible situation for you to find yourself in, bundled in bags like a corpse, just so you could send them back to to, to, to danger. So how how where is humanity today? And you see that that is a complete different situation for some other set of people. So um, the reason why you know, we, are, we keep on advocating for this is to, for people to understand that humanity is universal, immigration is a black issue, the same attention that has been offered to other parts of the world that are facing violence and you know, war and you know, conditions such as Cameroon should be offered as well. And you know, international organizations, international you know, power, powerful countries should take into the, upon themselves to try to respond externally to support and solve the situation that's happening in Cameroon. Um, I, I'm not, I'm not going to add much, but just to say that we are, of course, grateful that the United States has finally recognized after several years of advocacy and effort through the Cameroon Advocacy Network and other organizations have been able to secure temporary protected status for Cameroon, but yet there's still much work to be done, such as protecting people who are still fleeing right now and uh, be able to solve the problem we have back home. I'm going to end it there so we can have more questions. Great. Um, thank you all very much. Um, I do have uh, one question from uh, the audience. What organizations um, can we support that are responding to the violence and the war? Um, who's working on this?
I think Jeff, Jeff is is better is the one who can answer this question because he's living in Cameroon, right, Jeff? Yeah. And maybe Jeff, you could also say a few words about what the church um, involvement have been in terms of uh, working towards the again the kind of peace peaceful resolution to the conflict because I believe you've been involved in some of that as well. Oh, it looks like we lost Jeff again. We cannot hear Jeff again. We lost your sound again. Now we've lost it. Um, yeah, yeah, while we try to get Jeff back. Yeah, while we're yeah, trying to get him back. And yeah, you know, like I was saying, the most important thing is for people to try to highlight and uh, talk about this thing, for, for create an awareness, just as we're doing here. Uh, we're calling on international media and people of, you know, influence to do something, talk about it, make efforts to shed more light on this issue. Personally, with the Cameroon Advocacy Network, we should just drop our website link on the chat. We don't work on the ground in Cameroon to solve the issue, but we are assisting individuals who are fleeing um, into neighboring countries and who are here in the United States to, for them to seek refuge and freedom. Um, but you know, um, other organizations who are on the ground, which you can find, I'm going to probably drop a link any moment from now, who can assist, you can assist them in some way, maybe support, that would be great. But um, with the Cameroon Advocacy Network, we are interested in, you know, you know, we are you know, primarily focusing on trying to save those who have been able to flee from this violence, you know, um, who are, in the neighboring countries around around uh, Cameroon and those who are in the, in the United States as well. So that's the primary focus. And also trying in the long run, trying to you know, create more awareness and enlightenment uh, of what's happening to, to bring a solution. So yeah, I'll pass it over to you, Kathy. Okay, am I am I back? Yeah, yeah. you're back, Jeff. Here you now. Okay, yeah, perfect. Sorry about the connection issues. Uh, just to quickly follow up uh, with what Daniel just, just said, uh, I work for Relufa which is an organization that is the local partner of the Joining, Joining Hands Network of the Presbyterian Hunger Program of PCUSA. PCUSA as a church has been very much involved in this crisis in trying to raise the issue at the level of the United States Congress. And actually, they have also issued some public statements about the necessity for a negotiated settlement of the conflict in Cameroon. So we work directly with the Presbyterian Church in the United States of America. And also, there is an agency of the United States of the PCUSA, which is called the Presbyterian Disaster Assistance. They have been taking care or trying to reach out to the internally displaced people affected by the conflicts uh, or the war in the Anglophone regions of, of, of Cameroon. So for now, in terms of the direct connection of the work that Relufa the organization for which I work, we collaborate with these two agencies of the Presbyterian Church uh, in the United States of America. And equally, the peacemaking program of PCUSA. They've actually invited us to come to the USA to talk about the peacemaking challenges in Cameroon as far as this war is concerned. But besides that, I think there are other organizations in Cameroon that are also working in terms of raising awareness raising the human rights challenges with respect to the war that is happening in the crisis, notably Human Rights Watch. They have also been very, very active in terms of bringing out some of the human rights issues with respect to this, uh, to, to this war. Again, as I say, in terms of the media, there's a lot of silence with respect to what is happening in these regions. And I also know, even for the media to send investigative journalism, it is not also easy because there is always this inhibition from maybe the, the power structures to allow journalists to go to that place to tell it as it is happening. Yes, there are a couple of organizations working in terms of uh, trying to raise the issue, the advocacy side of, of it, and also the humanitarian part of it. Thanks, Jeff. And I can also add, um, as Presbyterian Church, we have the Presbyterian Ministry at the UN, and many of the other faith organizations similarly have presence um, at the United Nations. 
And my colleague there says that one of the efforts um, is to meet with the Undersecretary General for Political Affairs and other UN agencies to also raise awareness and encouraging the power and influence of the Secretary General to mediate with political leaders of Cameroon about ending the violence and to open political dialogue. And I wonder if any of you have any reactions to that effort. Um, what are your I think thoughts? For me, just to say, for me, I just to say, I applaud any initiative that is going to contribute at least to raise awareness and also engage people who can also engage the power structures to try to engage. I, I think I have the firm con that Cameroon is always sensitive to what others are saying. So for this crisis to end, I think it will not just be an internal issue. They need to be sustained engagement and pressure put on Cameroon, you know, to try to solve this. So what I can just say is to applaud, you know, such initiatives and we need many more of such. And we only have about one minute left. So any final comments, Kathy, please? Yeah, yeah. Thank you, uh, Susan. Thank you, Jeff. I wanted to say the same thing because we have reached a point where um, if there's no in uh, at the government of Cameroon, nothing will happen, nothing will move. Yeah. Yeah. And that peace that we're yeah. looking forward to will never happen. Yeah. Because internally, there's no hope. There's no hope because the political structure, as Jeff just mentioned, is completely blocked. Yeah. So we need international help in this yeah. issue. Thank you. That's right, Katin. And I just wanted to add, you know, based on uh, Reverend uh, Sharon's question about how the faith community could be particularly, you know, influential on the crisis, you know, to support Cameroonians, both in Cameroon and in the U.S. I think it's very important because, you know, faith is always a strategic um, issue. People are more so come to, you know, understanding when it comes to a faith-based approach as to humanity. So faith leaders, um, I, I, the other day I was talking like a joke. I, I wish I had a number, the number to the Pope or some other important, you know, influential religious person to call and say, do something other than making a statement. So I think faith leaders, faith institutions, and faith structures should continue to do more efforts as to putting pressure on the, on the Cameroonian government. Thank you, Daniel. I think that's a wonderful place to end our conversation. Um, thank you again to all three of our speakers today and for those of you who joined us. Have a good day. Thank you, sir.